Uh, okay, so uh, we've covered uh, two of the four major topics. So, okay, we finished cryptography and we finished uh, access control. So the third major topic is protocols. We have uh, two chapters on protocols. Okay, the first chapter, chapter nine, which will be on the uh, second midterm, uh, discusses, uh, the title is simple authentication protocols. I don't think simple is not the, quite the right word. Uh, it doesn't mean they're easy. It means they're sort of stripped down of all of the unnecessary sort of bookkeeping, bookkeeping kinds of details that are, you must have in a real world protocol. Okay, all that stuff is kind of necessary, but it has nothing to do with security. So these are kind of stripped down protocols that just emphasize the security features so we can look at what we need in security protocols. Okay, and we do this in kind of a not a real rigorous form, kind of an intuitive uh, form, just to keep it uh, a lot simpler. Um, and then chapter 10, we actually get into real world protocols. Okay? So that's, that's the game plan here. Okay, now what are protocols? I and mean, just in general, it just means the communication rules that you follow. Okay, that's maybe a generic description. Uh, and humans, if you think about it, humans have a lot of protocols that they follow. Uh, you know, just think of the, suppose you want to ask a question in class. Okay, so what's the protocol? What do you do? Raise your hand, okay, and then what? Then I'm supposed to call on you, and then what? And you ask your question, and then I say, I don't know, and then we go on to the next stuff. Okay, that's the way it works in this class. Um, okay, so if you think about it, it's kind of interesting if you tried to write down, you know, human protocols in detail. There's a lot of special cases you have to consider, and lots of things that go wrong, and yet the protocol still works and all that sort of stuff. And it's really because humans have sort of <coughs> common sense, you know, at least most humans have some common sense, and they can kind of fill in the details, you know, things don't go exactly according to plan. But if you take a networking class and you look at networking protocols, those things, you know, they're specified down to exactly which bit goes where. You know, if you don't get exactly that bit in exactly the right place, it's not going to work. Okay? Why is that? Computers have no common sense. Computers are really stupid. Okay, you have to tell them exactly everything. It has to be exactly what they're expecting, exactly right, or it's not going to work. Okay, for security protocols, uh, I mean, that's just the communication rule. Really, when we say protocols and security, implicitly we're talking about networks, okay? So these are networking protocols. So there are a specific class of networking protocols that deal with uh, security. And as I said, the next chapter we'll talk about some specific, you know, well-known protocols, SSL and Kerberos and so on. Okay. Uh, yeah, and protocols, hopefully in this class even today, I'll convince you that they can be pretty subtle, okay? In the sense that small changes to the protocol can take a, an insecure protocol, make it seemingly trivial change to it, and make it secure, and vice versa. So you really have to be careful when you deal with protocols. You know, it's easy to look at something and say, well, that must work, but it doesn't. Or look at it and be very suspicious, as you always should be, and finally conclude that it does. Uh, and just because the protocol's got a big name attached to it doesn't mean that it's necessarily all that good. <laughs> uh, WEP is probably the classic example. There's lots and lots of security flaws with WEP, as we mentioned. But others, you know, even something like IPsec, which is you know it's the security in IP version six, uh, has some problems. And we'll mention that when we get to it. And even if the protocol itself is secure, uh, it's possible that when it's implemented, there could be problems and it will ultimately suffer from that. Uh, and there's a famous case of this, uh, maybe, I don't know what it was, two or three years ago, there was a, a version of Internet Explorer that had a flawed implementation of SSL. And it was a very subtle, minor flaw to the protocol, but it made the thing, you know, opened up avenues of attack on the protocol. Okay, so the bottom line is, it's not easy to get these things right, either from a design phase or even from an implementation point of view. Okay, so what do we want in a security protocol? We want it all. Okay, we want everything, of course. Okay, so, you know, it's like anything else. It, you know, when you're developing software for any application, say, you're, you're given some, some problem you're trying to solve. Maybe it's a payroll application. You have to solve the payroll application, okay? That's number one. <laughs> So you're given some problem, you have to meet those you know, sort of basic security requirements. You know, Alice has to be authenticated, you have to do whatever, whatever. Okay, that stuff, of course, has to be met. But beyond that, 
you know, what do you want from your program? You probably want it to be as efficient as possible. Okay, now, that can mean there's sort of two different senses of efficiency here, right? Okay, if you're doing something over a network, well, these protocols are going to involve sending messages over the network, right? So you probably want to minimize the amount of traffic that you need to send over the network. So that's a kind of efficiency. Okay, but also, we're going to have some cryptography going on here. Right? So if we're doing, in particular, public key operations, now that's going to be pretty costly. So we may want to minimize the computation. Okay? How can we make it more efficient in that sense? Okay. So efficiency, a couple of different ways. Uh, another thing, you know, lots of other things you could think about. Um, one that might not be so obvious, uh, you sort of want the, pro you probably want the protocol to be somewhat robust in the sense that if somebody uses it in maybe not exactly the same situation as you designed it for, it will still work and not break down. Of course, you can't imagine all possible ways somebody could abuse your code, but you know, you should uh, at least think about trying to make it somewhat robust. Okay, so it's going to be hard to uh, meet all these requirements. Okay, so um, these are probably my two favorite quotes in the book, you know, because they work so well together. Uh, you know, and quotes are important. I spent a lot of time picking the quotes in the book because, you know, I judge books largely by the quotes that are in the book. You know, if quotes are good, it must be a good book. So, um, but uh, there's a saying, I think we mentioned this a couple times, you know, uh, complexity is the enemy of security, okay? So in general, you want things to be simple, but that's not a guarantee <laughs> things are going to be good. So, okay, so here's a quote from Lou, uh, Alice in Wonderland. So, I quite agree with you, said the Duchess, and the moral of that is, be what you would seem to be, or if you'd like it put more simply, never imagine yourself not to be otherwise than what you, it might appear to others that what you were or might have been was not otherwise than what you would have been, I can never get that right, have <laughs> appeared to them to be otherwise. <laughs> like a tongue twister. And then the second quote, seek simplicity and distrust it. So. Okay, so before we get to sort of the actual networking protocols, let's just look at some kind of general security-related protocols. Okay, now, uh, if you want to get entry into a secure facility, well, how would that go? Um, how does it go when you go to work? What do you do to get into work? What do you have to do? You have a badge, okay, right? So you have that same thing, okay? I have a badge, and I go into work. Uh, you show it to a security guard, or how does it work? Well, okay, at NSA, they actually have a scanner. Okay, so you put it in the scanner, okay? And once you put it in the scanner, then what do you do? You sit out. <laughs> you type in a PIN number, okay? It's just the you know, simplest thing you could think of. So you type in the PIN number. Okay, if you get the PIN number correct, what happens? You're in, okay? You get to go to work, okay? You get the PIN number wrong, what happens? You get shot by the security guard. <laughs> Now, of course, that's an exaggeration. You get three tries before you get shot by the yeah. security guard. <laughs> on that third try, you're really sweating it out. You're not <laughs> okay, if you think about it, that's essentially the same thing as you do with an ATM machine, right? You have an ATM card. You put it into the card reader. Uh, you type in the PIN number. If you get the PIN number correct, <coughs> okay, you can do whatever you're allowed to do. If you get the PIN number wrong, what happens? Yeah, I, I guess if you get it wrong enough times, you lose your card, eat your card. Okay. Here's another uh, kind of interesting protocol. This is in uh, Ross Anderson's book, the first edition of his security engineering book, which you can get for free uh, online. I recommend you look at that. Um, he claims in the book that this actually happened. Okay, this was like a real protocol that was used, you know, in the, in the 70s and in the real world. And the reason he knows it was real, it's a kind of funny story, is that uh, he was sitting at some bar somewhere in South Africa and some guy came up to him and claimed to be a former South African general and started telling him about this security protocol they used. And right off the bat, I'd be a little suspicious about that, you know, that whole thing, but that's what he claimed. Uh, then you read, He's got an errata, you know, the errors that appear in the book, and somewhere there he says, well, apparently this never actually happened. <laughs> but it makes a good story. Okay, so the story goes, uh, this is a war that was occurring in uh, what's now Namibia. Okay, so here's South Africa, here's Angola. 
So Angola was a Russian satellite state. And, you know, South Africa was sort of nominally allied with the West. So you know, he's got this Cold War kind of situation there, battling over Namibia. Okay. So the Angolans are flying Russian MiGs, right? And South Africans have uh, their own uh, uh, Air Force jets. So South Africans have this base in uh, Namibia from which they fly missions, right? Now, if an airplane's coming into your base, what do you want to know? Friend or foe? Okay, is it one of ours? Is it one of theirs? One of ours? Fine. One of theirs? Start shooting very quick, okay? And you have to de decide this quickly, right? Because these things are moving very fast, okay? Once they get in range, you have to know. So they need some way to identify friend or foe. Okay, so here's what they came up with. Very simple, simple protocol. They have a key, okay, and the key is known to the base, and the key is known to all the aircraft, okay, they're on their side, right? Uh, and when an airplane <coughs> gets within range, they send it some random number. Okay, now, what are you going to do to prove that you're this aircraft? You're going to do something that shows that you know the key K. What do you suppose you would do that would show that you know the key K? Just encrypt it, send it back. They have the key there so they can verify that it was encrypted properly, right? So that's as, about as simple as it gets. Okay. Now all this happens automatically because it has to happen very fast. You don't want the pilot to miss the button once and get shot down, right? So all this happens automatically. It looks good, right? Okay, but there's an attack here, all right? And the problem is, the, the situation is this. So, this uh, Russian MiG here is sort of, you know, close to the base there, but he's staying out of range, okay? He's just sort of loitering out here until everything lines up properly, okay? Now, the South Africans are flying some mission up here in Angola. <coughs> now, when the South African jet gets <coughs> within range of the Angolan radar, then they tell this guy to go, okay? So, that's the setup. Now, he's going in. He gets close. He's within range. What's going to happen? Angola's Oh, he's going to get a random number. They're going to send him the random number, right? Friend or foe. There's the protocol. They send him the random number. What does he have to respond with? This thing encrypted with the key K. He doesn't know the key K. He's going to get shot down, right? He's hosed here. Well, no. He can tell the Angolan radar. Here's the challenge that I got, and the Angolan radar can send this to the South African jet, which is now in range, and it's all automated, right? Because it has to happen fast. So this comes back to the Angolan radar, which forwards it back to the Russian MiG, which sends it back and bombs start falling. All right. So again, you know, the protocol it seems simple, it seems to do what you want to do, but there's potential vulnerability here. Okay. And there's another kind of interesting story unrelated to this, but um, I think he mentions this even in the book that. Um, the Russian MiGs, okay, uh, at the time, they were really surprised by the skill of these pilots. Uh, they knew the Russians weren't, or they thought the Russians weren't actually in Angola. And so were these Angolan pilots flying these Russian MiGs? Well, you know, they just got them. How could they have the skill to fly them so skillfully and all, all of that? So they eventually uh, discovered that it was uh, Cuban pilots flying the Russian MiGs. You know how they figured that out? I asked this in my previous class, and somebody said, oh, there was some guy smoking a big cigar driving here. <laughs> no, that wasn't right. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> well, that would be a good guess. Uh, that would be a good guess, too. But what they actually found, but that's not the case, what they actually found was uh, from satellite photos, what they saw were baseball diamonds. And the only countries in the world at the time who played baseball were the United States, wasn't us. And Japan, we figured it wasn't Japan. And Cuba. <coughs> it was a big baseball playing, playing country, so that settled it.